it was such an unexpected turn of events. You know, to, to misquote what Churchill said about democracy, it's a hell of a lot better than the other alternatives. It was the product of struggle. Of, of dreams, of imagination, and intense collegiality and intelligence. The Constitution still is the glue that holds the South African society together. In order for the new South African democracy to occur, there needed to be forces within the National Party that drove them to the negotiating table. The National Party needed to recognize that the apartheid policies were not only politically, but morally untenable. My guest today was the first senior member within the National Party to publicly apologize for the apartheid state. He is an Afrikaner nationalist turned impassioned universal human rights advocate. He serves as an excellent example of how we can rise above our own fallibility if we only have the humility to learn from the mistakes we made in the past. Mr. Leon Vessel's life is certainly fascinating, and I am honored to have the chance to speak to him today. Hello, Mr. Vessels. How are you? I, I'm well. Thank you so much for uh, this opportunity and, and honor of speaking with you, Gabriel. Well, Mr. Vessels, where did you grow up? May I? Uh, my parents were civil servants. My father was a policeman, my mother a teacher. So my father was often transferred from one place to the other. Uh, broadly speaking, I would uh, I think of myself as someone who spent my earlier years in Freiburg in the Northern Cape rural area. He was then transferred to Durban, where I uh, spent some time, and then uh, finally uh, to Krugersop, where I attended my high school years and where I uh, lived my political life, so to speak, in the years that followed. What was it like uh, growing up during apartheid? It wasn't complicated. It was a way of life uh, as a young boy. Uh, that's how we lived. Uh, we had friends across the color divide. We played a lot. But when evening fell, when dusk fell, we parted ways. We went to our own houses, our own bedrooms, attended our own schools. And there was always this sense of um, almost instilled in us of, of superiority. This is the way it is, and this is the way it's going to be. And uh, one lived that life without really questioning it. And um, did your parents um, have any influence on your political views while you were growing up? When one looks back... Uh, at those years, undoubtedly so. However, they were not politically inclined. My, f my father, being the policeman I uh, alluded to earlier on, believed that you serve everyone in the community. Uh, and he hated party politics in particular. Uh, and my mother was a very gentle woman, uh, the teacher that she was, and it, it was enjoyable to be in a company in her company. So they didn't drive me in a particular political direction, but I would like to believe in honoring them that the values that they in a very quiet way instilled in me uh, later in life shaped me and helped to become who I, who I did become. And um, what about uh, your church? What influence did that have on you? One must not forget that in the earlier years, the Dutch Reformed Church, the church that we belong to, uh, was 
in a lighter tone always referred to as the National Party in prayer. So uh, the Dutch Reformed Church were very supportive of the National Party gov uh, government and 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 uh, and shall I say its leadership, broadly speaking, its leadership. It was only in later years, uh, I would venture to say during my student days uh, and even beyond that the National Party and the Dutch Reformed parted ways, not in a serious manner, but there were certainly voices that I associated with and that uh, I was felt attracted to and that inspired me to uh, to draw a line in the sand and said, well, first of all, you cannot justify uh, apartheid on, on, on religious grounds, first of all, and secondly, we have to to uh, to make a U-turn. Uh, so in that sense, it was only later in life. And, and those figures uh, were larger than life figures, and they reached out across the political divides and also across the racial divides, and they greatly inspired me. It's something I've wondered about. And in your book, Encountering Apartheid's Ghosts, uh, you mentioned that there was a distinct feeling um, when you were growing up within the Afrikaans community of having suffered previous grievances at the hands of the English during the, uh, the Boer War, the Boer Oorlog. Um, and to me, I've always felt that this might make the community more sympathetic to the oppressed. But why then was the response to double down and kind of turn the tables and become in many ways, the oppressor. Uh, that That is a very tricky question to answer because I have grappled with it in the past and I still continue to grapple with it. Uh, if you read some of the Afrikaans newspapers, even to this day, here in Gauteng, where I live, there are always uh, columns publishing uh, stories about the Anglo World War. It's, it's quite strange. It, it, it continues and it continues to attract attention. I think uh, I can say that without uh, being questioned that the Afrikaner people during that particular war was humiliated by the British. Uh, there are enough examples of that. And that sparked a feeling of, of Afrikaner nationalism. And it sparked that sense. It drove Afrikaner nationalism uh, to the hilt. But then that sense of, of now being in power um, almost drove them to the, to the other extreme believing that we now have to protect this power that, that we hold in our hands. Um, and in that sense, then overstepped the mark by, by again humiliating fellow South Africans, almost as if Afrikaners believed that they were the only people that suffered and were humiliated. And often it was only later years that I personally and Afrikaners in general came to realize that we were all humiliated uh, in, in, in that war because our fellow South Africans had uh, the hopes that they would, at the end of the war, at the conclusion of the war, being recognized as full South African citizens and have the rights to participate in 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 governing uh, our country so we were all humiliated it's a difficult question to answer but i'd like to uh, to believe that we were blinded by our own humiliation and we couldn't see uh, the tree from the woods that makes a, a lot of sense and so during your travels abroad after you finished uh, school 
you met um, several people who were highly critical of the apartheid state. And uh, what effect did this have on the way you viewed apartheid at the time? Uh, profound. It had a profound effect on me uh, in a number of ways. First of all, if when you travel, it it broadens your horizons, but but it also creates an opportunity to look at yourself from from the outside. I mean, left. I wanted to uh, my hitchhiking experience as a cycling experience abroad after school. Um, was sparked by the idea to 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 understand and discover the the bigger world for myself, but the spin-off was that I couldn't defend apartheid. First of all, secondly, not only could I not defend it, I I realized that apartheid, uh, as envisaged uh, by, shall I say, the apartheid postals at the time. Uh, was totally impracticable and 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 wouldn't uh, real uh, materialize or realize the results which which they env- envisage. So those earlier travels broadened my or- horizons. Later, later travels, as as a as a student, as a backbencher in parliament, helped me to shape my my thinking. And mold my my own, uh, shall I say, uh, hopes for the future. You come back from traveling abroad, and then you go to university. Is that correct? And that have I got the chronology chronology correct there? Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And, sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> and um, so you. What path did you take from coming back and returning from your travels that made you enter the government as a member of the National Party? Well, when I returned, I, I had this... Uh, I, I was standing on a new ideological platform, so to speak, realizing that uh, things cannot continue uh, as 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 was envisaged. But I didn't become a political activist there and then, and neither did I become a revolutionary. My main aim was to study law, to uh, I, to really be the best lawyer I possibly could. But with that narrow approach, I ended up becoming a student leader. And being a student leader in South Africa, you cannot shy away from the politics of the day. So there was another one or two uh, moments which which stand out. First of all, I got to meet fellow students uh, from the University of of, of the North, Old Terfloop, and 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 just sitting down, talking, speaking, debating with them, hopes and fears for the future, uh, again broadened my horizons. And at a, at a student conference of which I was a national student conference uh, of the Afrikaans Studentenbond, of which I was the president at the time, one of my idols, Professor Marinus Wicher, said, you know, we have a lot of questions, unanswered questions in a society, and your generation will have to find answers for those questions. However, you will not have the luxury to find it all on your own. You'll have to do it with fellow South Africans. So it, I would say this was a second phase uh, in my political journey, almost a phase that I didn't envisage when I first traveled abroad, secondly, when I entered uh, university, and there I left university uh, with a with the aspiration of being a good lawyer, but but also politically shaped and molded. Then, once you leave university, what pushes do you? What pushed you into the National Party? 
Well, a, a few interesting things happened, and I have to give credit to to F. W. de Klerk, who was a young backbencher in Parliament. Then he said, "You know, uh, a lot of things will will have to change and will happen, and we'll need young young people in in politics." And I said, "Well, I'm not sure I want to enter the political fray," and some of the political elders in my community, so to speak, said, you know, you don't want to enter politics now. But when the moment arrives for you to, to want to enter politics, politics may not want to accommodate you. So the answer is that the, uh, the advice is join the political fray here and now. And I thought, well, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a young lawyer. People, I can always return and uh, if I make a mess of, of, of politics. And uh, I'm young enough, if I make a, uh, a mess of politics, nobody would even have noticed, so to speak. And that's how I ended uh, the National Party and became a member uh, of Parliament for the constituency of Kruger's Abue, where I still live. And um, what were you hoping to achieve when you started your political career? I didn't have a clear vision at that stage. All The only thing that was clear to me that th we couldn't cling on to the past, neither could we cling on to the status quo. Something had to give, we had to change, and we had to enter uh, discussions and dialogues with our fellow South Africans, as, as I had learned and discovered during the, those uh, student encounters with my fellow students from the University of the North. Uh, and I was hoping that we would be able to... S I remember Abram Tiro, uh, who was chairperson of the student council, and, and uh, when I was chair of the stu student council at uh, Poch of Strum, said, you know, we must sit around the table and find a solution which, which is lasting. And, and that was inspirational. And that was what I was hoping for. I... I had no clear vision of the outcome, but realizing uh, we had to sit down and talk. It excited me. That in particular excited me. Between 1991 and 1994, you actually did achieve that goal and sitting down and talking. But I'm wondering, what path did your career take to, that led you to become involved in the negotiations for the new South African constitution? Um, I... I, when I entered Parliament, I had this, uh, uh, I think it's fair to say I had this label or this tag that I was curious, uh, I, was, I was not uh, uh, a verkramte, so to speak, I was an enlightened person, was open to new ideas, I had built something of a track record uh, reaching out to other South Africans across the old political divides. So I had that track record, and I do believe that my political career took that uh, basic uh, tenets forward. So when the moment arrived to sit down at a negotiating table, I wasn't surprised, and I don't... And I think I was almost like an, an obvious choice to be part of the National Party negotiating team. I wasn't uh, the lead negotiator, of course not, Rolf Meyer, uh, first Gerard Verjun and then Rolf Meyer, but everyone knew that one may almost say in, 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 in terms of, of if, if I may use... Uh, a sporting example. I wasn't uh, a frontline striker, but I was a good player from the bench. <laughs> and so in, uh, in 1990, you became the first senior member of the, of the Nats, of the National Party, 
uh, to publicly apologize for apartheid. What had led you to the point in which you decided that this was this statement needed to be made? I was quite surprised at the amount of attraction that statement drew. Uh, then, here, abroad, everywhere, uh, I, it never dawned on me that it was going to be a big statement. It, it, it seemed so obvious to me, and I thought everyone was on the same page, which was not the case, because it, 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 this idea of, of, uh, of apartheid, uh, first of all, being not a workable, impractical policy. It takes you quite a while to stand up and to say that. Then once you've done that, you, you, you become alive to the fact that apartheid was brutal. And, 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 and you deal with the brutality of it all. And you again stand up and you make friends and you lose friends. And, and then finally you have to deal with the morality of it all. And by the time we, uh, we got around to, to sit around the negotiating table, it sounded, it looked so obvious to me. Uh, that this was the thing to say and to do. Uh, I I was never attracted to the idea that we are now negotiating because the Berlin Wall collapsed and and things like that. Uh, that 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 argument never quite appealed to me, and that was the reason why where when I made that statement and. I, I was really surprised when when uh, there was such a hoo -ah about it at the time. I thought it was a, the natural thing to say and to do. And so <clears throat> you were you obviously garnered quite a lot of fame from that statement, and you were a solid the solid backbencher from instead of the lead striker, and so you come into the uh, the negotiations with this uh, kind of history. And I was wondering, so what was your role in the negotiations for the new democratic South Africa? I think one uh, must uh, look at the two phases, really. The first phase was when we sat around the negotiating table, crafting the interim constitution, preparing for the general uh, democratic elections in 94. Uh, that was the first phase. The second phase was the constitutional assembly drafting uh, the final constitution as we know it today. The first phase, I was part of, of, of the national party team. I was playing from the bench so to speak, I was at times a Mr. Fix-It, uh, try and break, break this deadlock, try and break that deadlock. Uh, and I loved every moment with it, meeting uh, people that we... Uh, I think it's, it's a bit hard to say that, that we're out of reach for us, but that, in fact, was what it was. How do I speak with a Joe Slovo? who's heading Mkonto with Sizwe and me having different roles. And here we are sitting together trying to find solutions. So I wouldn't elevate myself to a higher level than saying, well, I was in the part of the National Party negotiating team here and there acting as a, as a Mr. Fixit trying to break uh, deadlocks. After the general election, the democratic elections, uh, a constitutional assembly was formed and charged with the responsibility to write uh, the constitution, the constitution as we know it today. And much to my surprise, uh, I became the deputy chair of that assembly. And Cyril Ramaphosa, the president, became the chair. It, it, it wasn't as if somebody um, sent a, um, 
an advertisement and say, who wants to be the deputy chair? We want you to apply for it. It just happened on one day. They said, well, you will be nominated. Uh, Tabo Mbeki will now stand up and nominate you as the deputy chair of the Constitutional Assembly. And uh, I realized that uh, Tabo would not have done that without consultation, consulting F.W. de Klerk and others. So much to my surprise, and that was uh, the pinnacle of my, uh, of my career, so to speak. Uh, there I was working with Cyril. I was still not the negotiator, chief negotiator for the National Party. Cyril had two ads. He was he was chair of the Constitutional Assembly and he was leading the ANC negotiating team. Rolf Mayer was, was the, leading the National Party negotiating team, of which I was a part, but I was also part of the inner circle with Cyril, ensuring that we would uh, deliver a constitution on time. And in your second role as the deputy chair, you're delivering the, what we now know as the final South African constitution. But um, the final South African constitution, and correct me if I'm wrong here, was based largely on um, the interim constitution that laid out a large number of principles around which the new South African constitution was, was based. Is that correct? Yeah, 34 principles. Uh, there was a, a lot of uh, uh, arm wrestling taking place to, to, to get uh, the constitution, uh, the principles part of the in interim constitution and to ensure that the final constitution would be grounded in those 34 principles and that the constant newly formed constitutional court would, would ensure that, that uh, those principles found their way into the Constitution. And so what were the most important inclusions you were pushing for in the negotiations when you were a Mr. Fixit and then when you were Deputy Chair um, of the Constitutional Assembly? You know... Uh, it's it's so exciting just to think about about it and think about those days. I uh, I wouldn't like to to uh, to to cite one or two examples unless you put a pistol against my head. I would just like to to set the scene and 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 explain a little bit to you uh, what happened. I remember one occasion when a, a, group, a group of six of us were asked to, to resolve a particular issue. Now, those negotiations uh, went, went long into the night and they started early. So the six of us were tired and we, and, and we then realized that, you know, we will have to resolve this. We are called upon to resolve this. And may I say at the outset, when you enter those little uh, inner negotiations within the negotiations, you do know and realize that failure is not an option. So the first thing we did on that particular occasion was to re rearrange the chairs, not the one side sitting opposite to the other, but formed a little circle because it was now the six of us against the rest of them. In other words, we, the, when we reported back to the general uh, negotiating teams, it, we, the six of us would be on the same side and we would have to defend the, pos the position we came to. It was so exciting because the art of negotiation is really to listen to listen what what drives the, the person or the other side of the negotiating table. And so that ended up with the six of us presenting a united position, which was accepted. But there was another occasion. 
And uh, I'll, I'll mention his name because uh, I kindly mention his name here. Dalla Omer and I was charged to resolve some, some issues. And the two of us said, you know, we just don't know what's wrong with these people. I mean, the, the two caucuses, what's wrong with these people? You and I are now sitting here, we're finding solutions. Let's go back and report our, our result. And, on, and in, in that particular meeting, uh, Nelson Mandela and Cyril Ramaphosa was sitting there and F.W. de Klerk and Rolf Meyer was sitting there. And we were smiling. We've got a solution. We've got a solution. When we presented, the, the, the outcome was not what we had hoped for. Uh, Mandela and Ramaphosa said, Omar, what have you been up to? What have you and, and Leon Vessels been smoking? What were you drinking? Kusato will never, ever accept this compromised position. And the clerk and Rolf Mayer said, Vessels, you've been under the influence of Dalla Omar for much too long. The two of you must go back and rethink this whole position because Kusato on the one hand and the employer associations will, uh, on the other hand, will simply not accept that. So we have to had to withdraw, swallow our pride, and start all over again. And that was the exciting part of, of, of all of it. If, if you will allow me, I just want to uh, mention uh, one little example. There was a there was a there was a there was a little uh, there was a little fight in a plenary session. A bit. Uh, and I was uh, I was leading the charge in this fight on behalf of the National Party, and Cyril uh, was on the other side of it, and and uh, it 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 was a, it was quite a, a forceful debate. So we meet in the corridors, and I said, Cyril, I don't like it when we speak like this with one another. We must resolve it. And he said, No, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You were simply presenting your party's position, and, and and there's nothing personal about it. I can go on, and and it will take you a long time to listen to all these little stories. But I think at the heart of it is the art of listening, and not ridiculing the arguments that you are forced to consider. I'd like to ask. During the um, the negotiating period, what were your hopes for how the outcome what, for what the outcome would be? Well, uh, all along since those uh, those earlier travels abroad, later travels abroad, my student years, uh, I was shaped by by uh, by many academics. Who, who instilled the idea of, of a democratic constitutional state in me with a justiciable bill of rights. So that was my, my ultimate hope and wish uh, for the negotiating process. Of course, I didn't, uh, in the beginning at least, have, have, have the the fine print uh, and the footnotes, footnotes of how this all would play out. But the notion of, of a constitutional state was, was paramount in, in, in my, to my mind. And coupled with that, a sense of justice. Uh, not, uh, and believing that the past will not simply go away. There, there had to be avenues how the the past would be addressed. But uh, one must appreciate that, that the negotiations took part in, uh, uh, played itself out under pressure cooker uh, circumstances. So one would, would have to create avenues how to continue the discussion and the debates. So you mentioned um, that there was 
being conducted under pressure cooker circumstances, what was the what were the circumstances that were creating the pressure for the negotiations to succeed? Well, first of all, when Nelson Mandela walked out of, of, of prison, he was not going to play a, 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 a minor role. Neither were his followers. The expectations were high that democracy was around the next corner. I lost you at the point where you said um, Mandela and his followers were not going to play a minor role. Yeah, absolutely so, because uh, the, the hopes that democracy was around the corner, that in itself, as well as the international community uh, following events very, very closely, that was part of the pressure cooker situation. Uh, we had to deliver a, a set of rules grounded in a constitution which would result in a democratic election. That was really at the heart of it all, and that created the pressure cooker uh, situation. There were further developments, Chris Hani's uh, murder, uh, the, the fact that we set a deadline for the elections and so forth, all added up. So this resulted in agreements, but one of the agreements would be that there would be further discussions and debates, be that in the field of socioeconomic rights, be it in the field of how we were going to address the past, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, and, and, and different pieces of legislation, such as the Act uh, regulating the right to information and fair administrative action and so forth. And so <clears throat> what were your fears um, about how the negotiations could go wrong? Well, the, the biggest fear was a collapse in the negotiation process where everyone returned to the trenches and... and uh, continue the armed struggle all over again. That was a particular fear. Another fear was that that there would be uh, in so much violence that uh, we couldn't proceed with the negotiating process. I would say those were paramount fears that I had. And what were your, the fears of your party? Well, there was a big concern in uh, in national party circles that uh, minority rights would be trampled would be trampled on uh, language cultural religious rights would not be uh, duly recognized uh, that uh, property rights would not be secured now, those were also my concerns, but they weren't paramount in my mind because I, I did believe that if, if the negotiating process continued uh, peacefully and respect, respectfully, solutions would be found for all those vexing questions. And um, it's almost a truism that the smallest minority is the individual. And so in securing uh, individ universal individual human rights, you're actually securing minority rights the greatest. Yeah. And, and if that was embedded in a Bill of Rights, there would be sufficient opportunity to, to participate in, in the regular democratic elections. There would be opportunity to... To, to voice your views, to march, to organize freedom of association and everything. Given that these, um, what you've laid out with the main party fears, were they trying to push for legislation that protected minority rights the most? Or what were the most important inclusions for the National Party? 
Well, I, I think the, the National Party uh, left the democratic South Africa, not the, demo, not the uh, de, uh, negotiating process, but they left democratic South Africa, the constitution, the constitutional dispensation, so to speak, because there wasn't entrenched power sharing. Uh, uh, that left them very uh, disgruntled. And they had a feeling that uh, they, there was a lack of, 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 of decentralized federal features uh, in the constitution. Be that as it may, I, I, I think the core rights that, that I embraced and, and, and believe in still creates opportunities for everything you hope and wish for. Uh, freedom of association does provide that. You, you can organize uh, your church, your language, your uh, religious uh, associations uh, to your, and mold it to your own liking. So with the benefit of hindsight, are there things you would have done differently during the two negotiations you were involved in for the Constitution? That, that, that is a difficult question. Uh, and it, it, uh, it is difficult because my, my, my approach to life is never to dwell too much on things that I, that I did wrong or didn't do wrong or that I should or should not have done. I believe if we had started this whole negotiating process 10 years earlier, we would have had a different country today. And so as a member of the National Party, when you do get involved in the uh, negotiations, there must have been a part of your supporter base that wasn't particularly thrilled and was a little bit disgruntled with your involvement in the negotiation process, especially if you were in a, a member of parliament in a National Party stronghold, so to speak. Did your involvement in the negotiations ever have an impact on your personal life? Well, uh, fierce battles were fought politically. Uh, the debates in the town hall with Clive Darby Lewis, etc., uh, were fierce. You lose friends, but you also gain friends. And that in itself becomes the inspiration. The fact that you are making new friends that you feel are on the same uh, value foundation. In other words, uh, there's not really time to, to dwell on, on, on the friendships that, uh, that fell by the wayside. You feel excited about the new friends and the ones that you are in agreement with. And that inspires you to reach out to the to the future, I believe that is also a personal uh, philosophy that that life is full of adversities, and it 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 matters how you conduct yourself during those uh, adversarial moments, and who do you align with. So I'm quite happy with the friends I have today. I feel a little sad about the ones I've lost, but I'm I enjoy my present company. As an Afrikaner and a former member of the National Party, it, kind of, it could be argued that you were giving up a significant amount of political power by allowing for a democratic South Africa and moving past the apartheid state. Um, however, I wonder what did you and Afrikaans people generally gain by allowing for the transition to democracy to happen? Well, most, I think what we really gained was that we were liberated from a past that, that, that could not be sustained and uh, in many ways left us feeling ashamed. So we were liberated from this past and we gained an opportunity with our fellow South Africans to hand in hand and together build a better future. We were not fighting for a better past. We were fighting for a better future. 
George Orwell has a an idea in one of his essays, which is that just as the uh, oppressor oppressed become kind of a caricature to the oppressor, the oppressor is actually a caricature to the oppressed. And so you gain the opportunity to no longer act as a caricature. I would go along with that. I want to, to end um, our discussion today by bringing it forward to the modern relevance of the, uh, of the Constitution, because recently it's, the Constitution has come under some, some siege. Um, which I think in many ways may be aided by a lack of understanding of what was at stake while it was being written, particularly by my generation of young South Africans. So if you believe the Constitution is still a relevant document, then could you put into words what the relevance of the Constitution still is? I think one must appreciate that the Constitution still is the glue that holds the South African society together in spite of criticism on, 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 on different sides of the political divide. It remains the greatest common ground between all of us. Uh, and if you don't have a constitutional dispensation uh, in other words, if you don't have any rules, uh, then not only is it a lawlessness, a lawless society, it is a, a society without without direction. In many ways, I understand why people feel disgruntled and and blame the constitution uh, for their for the state of affairs. I think it was uh, Sir Malcolm Fraser, Fraser who once said, you know, that good people can make bad constitutions work and bad people can destroy good constitutions. If, 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 if the policeman uh, tears his docket to pieces, it has got nothing to do with the Constitution. I think it has to do with the fiber of our society. Constitutions are never as good as their advocates claim, and it's never as bad as their detractors claim. I believe the way we govern within the framework of the Constitution and the way society carries itself within the ambit of the Constitution leaves a lot to desire because the Constitution is not a service delivery a document. It provides the framework in which we can do political battle with one another and it indicates who has what authority and what power and we have to hold those in power accountable. Uh, for their misconducts or their poor performance. Well, Mr. Vessels, thank you so much for speaking to me today. It has been incredibly fascinating to learn about your life and to see exactly what a little bit of the impact your life has had on mine in producing a South African constitution which I got to live under. So it's been such a privilege to talk to you. Thank you so much. The privilege, the honor was mine. Thank you, Gabriel. I wish you the very best with all your endeavors.